So it uh, falls to me the great privilege of introducing my colleague, Dr. Erin Bahula May. Uh, Erin is, is no stranger to this island, as uh, she was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, where she got her uh, Doctor of Philosophy degree in molecular biology. Uh, she is one of these incredibly uh, impressive uh, Brigham people that it's been my privilege uh, to rub shoulders with through the years. Uh, she is what we call in the U.S. triple boarded in internal medicine, cardiology, and in critical care. Uh, she attends in our coronary care unit, which is a uh, incredibly uh, difficult uh, job. Uh, I stay on the step down unit and take her patients when her patients are well enough for someone like me to take care of uh, as she has shepherded them through the acute phase of their illness. But as you will see, she is also a very accomplished clinical investigator. And I have to add that uh, this year, there was a very tough competition for an award uh, of uh, considerable financial import that is uh, given to a young faculty member uh, in the name of Dr. Eugene Bromwald. And, uh, in this very tough competition, Erin came out on top, and she is the inaugural uh, Bromwald uh, Young Faculty Scholar at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, so she is going to uh, talk to us. She could talk about many things, but she's going to talk to us about at the limits of lipid management, statins to PCSK9 inhibitors. Erin? Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for the introduction, and, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, it's been a while since I've been back, and, and it's very nice to be back on, on UK soil. So um, as you heard, I'll be talking to you a little bit about uh, the lipid management, um, and I'll focus uh, on statins and PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, so my uh, disclosures are shown here, um, the most notable of which are that we have research grants from Amgen, Merck, and uh, the medicines company. Um, uh, for our work with the Timmy study group. Um, so what I'm hoping to address, uh, you'll see the scope is fairly large, um, is really questions in lipid management and the very basic questions of what should we be targeting, how should we do it, in who, for how long, and how much. Um, and so we'll see if I can get through this in my allotted time. Um, so just to take it back to basics, um, I'll remind you of the, the lipoprotein biology. So lipoproteins are the way that, that our body uh, can transport hydro, hydrophobic uh, lipids, uh, so specifically cholesterol and triglycerides, um, between organs in the body, the muscle, the adipose, and the liver. And the ones that are really most, uh, sort of most interesting and most notable are VLDL and IDL, which are triglyceride-rich um, lipoproteins, um, and then ultimately, which becomes metabolized to LDL and LP little a, which are cholesterol-rich lipoproteins. All of these have a protein on the surface, a single copy of ApoB, um, and all of these together are termed uh, non-HDL cholesterol, which is really the total cholesterol minus the HDL. And it's believed that, that these uh, in total are likely the atherogenic lipoproteins that ultimately lead to vascular disease and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, in contrast to HDL, um, which is the uh, thought to be the non-atherogenic uh, particle, um, which ultimately is responsible for reverse cholesterol transport of uh, cholesterol from, from the tissues uh, uh, back to the liver. So which of these should we be targeting and what's the data for that? Um, so there, there's a large body of epidemiologic literature um, that suggests that there is a inverse relationship between HDL concentration and cardiovascular outcomes. So cardiovascular <laughs> outcomes are better when uh, HDL is higher, and this has been validated in multiple different epidemiologic studies, the association between these two things. However, when we look to genetics, uh, while we see that there is a very robust association between uh, genetic variants that lead to alterations in LDL cholesterol, we don't see that same association with HDL cholesterol. Um, and there have been, as you probably know, multiple uh, attempts to raise HDL, to pharmacologically raise HDL. Two are shown here, the HPS2 uh, Thrive study and AIM High with niacin. Uh, which uh, successfully raised HDL, but which did not alter cardiovascular 
outcomes. And so it's in light of this data plus other, other data that I'll refer to later with the CETP inhibitors that led us to ultimately believe that probably HDL is not a modifiable uh, risk factor, but rather a marker of cardiovascular risk, that it's a marker of other things which drive uh, 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 poor cardiovascular outcomes. So we know that, that HDL tends to be lower in people who are smokers, who are sedentary, obese, insulin resistance. <laughs> Um, and so ultimately, pharmacologic approaches to alter HDL it probably won't be fruitful. It's rather risk factor modification related to these, these other uh, risk factors that probably will, will provide benefit. Now moving on to a specific cholesterol moiety, the triglyceride, um, that is contained within, as I mentioned, VLDL and IDL predominantly. Um, there is genetic data in contrast to what we saw with the HDL. Uh, there is genetic data to support uh, a relationship between triglycerides and cardiovascular outcomes. So for example, I'm showing you data here from St. Catharacin at the uh, Mass General looking at loss of function mutations in a specific apolite lipoprotein, which ultimately resulted in lower levels of triglycerides and lower rates of, of CHD. Now the, the clinical data is mixed in terms of efforts to lower triglycerides, um, but there is now recent data from Deepak Bhatt and his Reduce It team uh, looking at, uh, apologies for how this came through, but looking at um, uh, a specific agent, icosapent ethyl, which is an EPA, which was dosed in, in, in high doses in patients who either had uh, established cardiovascular disease or diabetes in some risk factor, so a primary prevention population. Um, who had elevated triglycerides in the range of 135 um, or higher uh, and relatively well-controlled LDL uh, between, uh, as is shown, 40 um, and ultimately 100, which doesn't project up there. Um, and in that setting of treatment with pr prolonged treatment with icosapent ethyl, there was a 20% reduction in triglycerides, about a 7% reduction in LDL, and also a significant reduction in CRP or inflammation as measured by CRP. Um, and in that setting, there was a really profound 25% reduction in cardiovascular events with a number needed to treat over the duration of the trial of about 21. Um, so profound benefit. I think the exact uh, uh, mechanism of benefit is still um, uh, kind of uh, uh, not completely understood, probably related to triglyceride lowering, maybe LDL lowering, potentially membrane stabilization from this um, uh, 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 EPA molecule, and then uh, potentially also some anti-inflammatory effects. But I think we'll learn more as time comes on about the benefit of this specific uh, therapy. And so now moving on to the, to the very large body of data uh, on uh, LDL reduction. Um, so I borrowed this slide from uh, my colleague Chris Cannon, uh, showing, demonstrating the enormous amount of, uh, of uh, investigation that's gone on around uh, statins, uh, uh, starting with really the landmark uh, 4S trial and going all the way through um, uh, 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 the primary prevention trial with Jupiter. And ultimately what we learned with this was there was a very consistent cardiovascular benefit of statins uh, in terms of reduction in cardiovascular events that was proportionate to the absolute reduction in LDL. Um, and so ultimately, for every one millimole per liter reduction in LDL, we saw a 22% reduction in major vascular events. And you see really, it, it plots out very nicely uh, in this meta-analysis done by the CTT collaboration. Um, and, and in terms of, I just showed you for the composite of mas uh, major vascular events, but it's also really consistent across the individual components. So that was true for improvements in, in reduction in MI, uh, stroke, coronary revascularization, and death. Um, so again, uh, uh, consistent improvements in cardiovascular events with, uh, with statins. Uh, but something that came out of this uh, body of literature was, was it the LDL reduction, was that really solely where the benefit lay was with LDL reduction, or was it related potentially to the, the specific therapy that was given, which was a statin? And could it be that, the, yes, statins reduced LDL, but there were other pleiotropic effects of statins? Um, and shown here is data from uh, Paul Ritker from the PROVE-IT trial, which uh, demonstrates what we know, which are statins reduce LDL. Uh, they have other benefits in terms of, of lipid profile, but they also lead to a reduction in inflammation as measured by CRP. And was it this sort of body of effects that ultimately translated to, to the benefit of statins? 
And so that really led us to the Improve It trial, um, which was uh, looking at non-statin mechanisms of LDL reduction and the, the then uh, 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 causal relationship in terms of cardiovascular events. In the Improve It trial, uh, we looked at over 18,000 patients who were post-ACS uh, with uh, LDL in the range of 50 uh, to 125, um, who were on a background of moderate intensity statin, uh, 40 of simvastatin, plus or minus azetamide, which was a cholesterol uh, 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 inhibitor, absorption inhibitor, and we followed for about six years. Um, in this study, uh, patients on uh, simvastatin had very well controlled LDLs down to a range of 69 to 70 milligrams per deciliter, and with the addition of azetamide, we saw about a 24% reduction in LDL further, which was a 17 milligram per deciliter further reduction in LDL uh, improvements in triglycerides, also a small reduction in CRP. And with that, there was a 6% relative uh, risk reduction in major uh, coronary events, cardiovascular death, major coronary events, and stroke, um, which translated to a number needed to treat of about 50 over the duration of follow-up. Um, and, and when you then look and you plot this on the uh, CTT meta-analysis curve, we see that it, that it plots perfectly on that. So again, as we saw with the statins, the cardiovascular benefit is proportionate to the absolute reduction in LDL, um, which in Improve It was small, but these patients also started out with very well-controlled LDLCs, so we saw a reduction on the order of a little bit less than a half a millimole per liter um, in these patients. So that really supports the notion that, again, the LDL hypothesis, that it's not solely a, you know, a, a statin that's the benefit, but we think probably uh, uh, predominantly the benefit in terms of LDL reduction. Around the time of Improve It, there were uh, investigations ongoing looking at at um, uh, families who had autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia, and, and PCSK9 was, inhibited, was identified as a, a gain of function mutation that led to familial hypercholesterolemia. And the biology of this was then, was then further elucidated. And what we now understand is that PCSK9 is a protein which binds to the LDL receptor, which leads to internalization of the receptor. Uh, so that there's lower levels of receptor on the, the uh, hepatocyte, and then therefore higher levels of circulating LDL, and, and then uh, ultimately worse cardiovascular outcomes in that setting. So there was uh, then uh, development of the PCSK9 inhibitors, which uh, specifically uh, the initial approach was a monoclonal antibody, which binds the PCSK9, uh, which then prevents binding to the LDL receptor, which prevents internalization of the LDL receptor, and then ultimately leads to more uh, uh, withdrawal of LDL from the serum, and so lower serum uh, LDL cholesterol levels. Um, we have now uh, multiple uh, studies looking at the three different uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. I'll tell you about two which are available for use now. Um, the first I'll tell you about is that it was studied in the Fourier trial, so it was a study of evolocumab uh, in 27,000 patients with established cardiovascular disease uh, with an MI stroke or symptomatic PAD. Uh, Evolocumab resulted in a 60%, 59% reduction in LDL um, from a baseline of 92 down to 30, so really profound and durable reductions in LDL. And in that setting, we saw a 15% reduction in the primary endpoint and a 20% reduction in the hard outcome of MACE. Um, and ultimately, the agent was safe and well tolerated. Uh, similarly, with Odyssey outcomes in an a a post ACS patient with the agent alurocumab, there was a similar profound reduction that was durable um, with this monoclonal antibody in LDL, um, which translated again to a benefit in terms of cardiovascular events, a 15% reduction um, in the composite uh, of CHD, death, MI, stroke, or hospitalization for unstable angina in this longer duration uh, of follow up. And with the longer duration of follow-up, at least that's potentially one of the mechanisms for uh, why there was also a signal specifically of a reduction in all-cause deaths, so a 15% reduction in all-cause deaths with this agent in a post-ACS population. Um, so what we now know is that, is that, that LDL reduction through statin and non-statin mechanisms are beneficial and, and improve cardiovascular outcomes. We believe it's related to the LDL and possibly to triglycerides. There was one piece of the story which was a bit confusing, and I think we probably have a pretty good idea on, on how, uh, how to explain this now, but that's why I say revisited in terms of what 
um, is the, uh, the CETP inhibitor story. Um, and so CETP, um, well, as I told you about HDL, uh, facilitates reverse cholesterol transport from the tissues. Uh, there is an enzyme, uh, the CETP uh, uh, enzyme, which ultimately removes cholesterol from HDL uh, and, and puts it in LDL. An inhibitor, the idea of an inhibitor of this phenomenon is that you actually reduce LDL you reduce uh, particle number uh, as measured by ApoB, so LDL particle number, uh, and then you ultimately increase the, the good cholesterol, as we think about it, HDL and, and, and the apoprotein that's associated with that ApoA1. And so um, there is a, a number of different studies, which I'm not going to go into all of them, uh, looking at this particular strategy. But the last of which was the REVEAL trial with anisotropib, um, which is an agent, uh, again, a CETP inhibitor. Um, and what we saw after a long duration of follow-up was there was a 9% improvement in, in cardiovascular uh, events with this agent. Um, and this was, this was notable in terms of the, the, what this actually, this agent did. It increased HDL profoundly, and I already showed you the data with, uh, in, with other agents that, that raising HDL we, we don't think um, probably actually impacts cardiovascular events, but this is, is a, uh, has a 100% uh, increase in HDL cholesterol. There is a 41% reduction in LDL cholesterol, or a, a absolute reduction of 26 milligrams uh, per deciliter or 0.7 millimoles per liter. Um, but interestingly, so the CETP inhibitors do something slightly different than statins and PCSK9 inhibitors, which reduce particle number. This reduces uh, LDL concentration more than particle number. So if you look at the reduction in particle number, which really we will often look at ApoB as the particle number, it's a less robust reduction in particle number. Another way to look at this is the non-HDL cholesterol. Um, and ultimately, when you then try to say what is the magnitude of benefit here based on either LDL concentration or LDL particle number as assessed by ApoB or non-HDL cholesterol, the, the, where you see the relationship that is consist, consistent with the statins is with the reduction in non-HDL cholesterol or with particle number. Um, and so this, this explains the story very nicely to say that what we think is it's a reduction in atherogenic particles that probably protects in terms of cardiovascular benefit. Um, and this has been borne out in the genetic studies where we, there, are, there are polymorphisms in the various components of the things that we treat with our CETP inhibitors, with our statins, with our PCSK9 inhibitors, and with azetamibe, where the, the improvements in cardiovascular or the cardiovascular benefit is really proportionate to that particle number or to the ApoB or non-HDL cholesterol. Um, so this, this ultimately uh, was very consistent with what we saw from the REVEAL study. And interestingly, and maybe relevant for the, uh, the REDUCE IT trial that I told you, there's other genetic data looking at genetic variants in LPL, which is something that specifically impacts triglyceride levels and doesn't impact LD, uh, LDL levels, uh, and the LDL receptor, which is specific to LDL and not triglycerides. And really where you see the benefit, again, is related to particle number and ApoB. So it's probably that non-HDL cholesterol, that ApoB, that is, that is important. At least uh, the genetic data supports that. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, quickly go through who, how much, and how long, because I'm running out of time. Um, what we've seen from the, the, um, the statin trials is that we think that there's a, a consistent benefit in primary prevention and secondary prevention, and that's, this is data from... Um, uh, Mark Sabatine and Mike Silverman uh, in the, with the statin trials showing, again, primary and secondary prevention. Uh, in, as said, with uh, the IMPROVE IT study, we looked at um, uh, patients according to risk, and this is using the TIMI risk score for secondary prevention, which basically just takes standard risk markers and looks at the uh, accumulated risk of these patients and the benefit. And what we see here is that, is that generally speaking, the benefit um, is, is preserved, although uh, we do have, because patients are higher risk when they have more of these risk factors, we see a greater absolute risk reduction, which translate to greater or lower number needed to treat in these individuals. Um, with the PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, there is really consistent benefit across all subgroups. Um, uh, and so we think that, that generally speaking, all patients benefit. Um, 
There is this notion, though, that if you take a high-risk individual by virtue of their higher absolute risk, that you can get a greater absolute risk reduction, um, and so that your number needed to treat is, is greater. So there's consistent relative benefit, higher risk translates to a lower number needed to treat, as, for example, shown here with the diabetic patients. Um, Similarly, in patients who've had a more recent MI, they're higher risk and they have a lower number needed to treat just because they're by virtue of being higher risk. But really no, no significant difference in their relative benefit. Um, I'll skip that. So the Odyssey outcomes, this is where this one, one question about benefit uh, came out um, in terms of whether there was anybody who had greater or less relative um, benefit. Um, in general, when we look across the subgroups, we see that there's no heterogeneity, and so we think that, generally speaking, the, the, the uh, relative benefit is consistent across all subgroups. The one question that was raised was around specifically mortality in patients who have a higher starting LDL, so an LDL greater than 100. You see, for the primary endpoint, uh, there it is sort of borderline in terms of statistical heterogeneity, um, and it was with the mortality signal that there may have been a greater benefit uh, in a post hoc analysis with those with higher LDLs at baseline. Although I will say this is not borne out in, in any of the other studies that we have. So this is data from the Fourier trial looking at baseline cholesterol levels of less than 70 or greater than 70 with the primary endpoint and secondary endpoint. And you see really consistency of benefit for, for uh, regardless of what your starting LDL is. And the same is true with the statin trial. So the CTT for people who start out with lower LDLs still had a benefit for uh, improve it. I showed you the Fourier data and for reveal. So I think, you know, taking the, the, the sum total of data, we think that regardless of where you start, these agents are beneficial. Um, and then finally, it's where, where do you land and what is the achieved LDL, what, what is the benefit associated with that. And this is, this is an analysis um, uh, by Bob Giuliano in, in my group, um, looking at achieved LDL and, and cardiovascular event rates. Um, and what we ultimately see is that, that there seems like there's benefit all the way down to extremely low levels of achieved LDL. And so my take home from this, which is honestly the take home that we had from Improve It as well, is that even lower is even better and that there probably doesn't appear to be a floor in terms of, in terms of benefit. Um, and so finally, how long? Um, what we saw from the CTT meta-analysis is that the benefit of, of lipid lowering is, is not as profound in the first year as it is in subsequent years. So the magnitude of benefit appears to be related to the duration of treatment. Um, the longer treatment, the greater benefit. Um, this was true in Fourier, where you look in the first year, a 16% reduction, and then beyond the first year, a 25% reduction. And then finally, in reveal, we see the same thing we saw with the CTT with statins. In the first year, you don't see a whole lot of uh, benefit, and then it increases as time goes on. So again, we think that the duration of therapy matters. And so there is this proposal out there to say that there is this idea of a cumulative exposure to, uh, to atherogenic particles, and that honestly, you know, uh, encouraging lower levels from a very early age ultimately shifts your risk of MI to a much later age. So we should probably be thinking about managing this at an earlier age um, to minimize the cumulative LDL exposure, which takes us to my final couple slides, um, looking at trying to think about tr translating uh, the th the, what we know about secondary prevention now down to earlier phases of disease. Um, so we've just initiated a trial with evolocumab, the PCSK9 inhibitor I described from the Fourier trial called the Vesalius trial, looking at patients who've not yet had a first event. So this, there is a population of patients that we'll be studying here, which are primary prevention, so diabetes without known established cardiovascular disease, and then other people with established cardiovascular disease, but no prior MI or stroke, and looking to see if we see benefit in this sort of primary slash uh, half secondary prevention, um, or kind of pre-first event, um, can we prevent first events? And then another area of interest in terms of the, where the space is moving is, is to other mechanisms of treating um, uh, hyperlipidemia. So something which is super exciting is a new molecule which is out in glycerin, which is an RNA interference um, molecule targeted 
for PCSK9. And unlike the monoclonal antibodies, which, which lead to degradation of the protein, this uh, does not allow for translation of the protein. So you do, do not get PCSK9, and ultimately you have the same benefit in terms of a reduction in LDL. Um, the effects of this are, are impressive in terms of the durability. This is early studies with, the, um, with this agent where a single dose and then a second dose all of this agent ultimately lead to a very prolonged reduction in LDL. Um, and so this is now being studied in a trial called Orion 4 uh, in secondary prevention with a, a, a sort of long interval dosing of every six months um, for hard cardiovascular events. So in summary, um, I think what we've learned uh, through, through this tour of lipid management is that lipid lowering um, through a number of different mechanisms, statin and non-statin mechanism, uh, reduces major cardiovascular events in a very predictable fashion that is related to the, rel and the relative risk reduction is really dependent on the magnitude of non-HDL or LDL lowering and the duration of treatment that LDL lowering, for LDL lowering, even lower is even better, and that we can achieve uh, uh, higher absolute risk reductions when we target those with highest risk. However, there probably is a benefit towards thinking about um, managing lipids at an earlier stage and also potentially of more durable therapies. Um, and something that Dr. Brunwald proposed, which I think is a, is a fascinating idea, is thinking about this sort of brave new world of can we give somebody, say, for example, their annual flu shot and then also their, their annual PCSK9 inhibitor RNA interference once a year um, and manage uh, risk factors from a uh, prolonged period of time uh, in a relatively uh, um, non-invasive sort of way. Um, and then this is all in the context of, um, of the idea that this is one part of our global risk management, right? That lipid uh, management is important, but there's also managing other risk factors, obesity, dysglycemia, hyper, uh, hypertension, inflammation, the list goes on and on. So this is one piece of controlling residual risk. And with that, I'll stop, and apologies for running late. <laughs>